Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another uh, Wine Spectator Two Bottle Tasting Series. Um, I'm Keith Goldston, Master Sommelier for Landry's Incorporated, and I am thrilled and honored to be joined by a, a dear friend and a co-worker, Travis Sinkle, Advanced Psalm and Wine Director, Beverage Director for the Post Oak Hotel in Houston, Texas. Travis, welcome to the show. Thanks, Keith. Great to be back. Yeah, and um, super excited today. A um, couple things. Uh, we're going to be featuring Del Frisco's Grill and Chef Ariel Fox's amazing meal kit. Um, if you haven't seen Ariel on Hell's Kitchen, she's incredible, and her cooking is phenomenal, and the to-go kit to pair up with these wines is just a rock star value, especially for like 125. So go check that out, swing by, pick that up, try those, those are awesome. But for me, the best part about today is we're gonna talk about Conundrum. And it was one of the first wines to kind of hit the scene where blends were prominent, kind of a fun, playful name. Uh, I mean, it was really kind of a groundbreaking wine and it came out of Camus a uh, great legendary winery of Napa. And if I remember correctly, Travis, you've got kind of a personal connection with this wine, right? I do actually, yeah. Some 14 years ago uh, on my first dating anniversary with uh, the woman who is now my wife, we ordered a half bottle of uh, Conundrum White, uh, a splurge for us at the time, but it was really fantastic and a great, uh, again, a great introduction to the winery uh, all those years ago. So this is uh, special for me. Yeah, and it's kind of funny for me too. I've had a little bit of a personal thing with, Camus in particular because I really want that motorcycle. I wanted a job. Two job options were available in Napa Valley for no experience. And one was a cellar rat at Camus Vineyards and the other was a busboy at an Italian restaurant. So I drove my little Honda Elite scooter up to Camus. I walked into the tasting room and was unbelievably intimidated. Uh, growing up in a Mormon <laughs> household, like all these wine bottles and wine, I'm like, oh, this is way too intense, way too evil. I got to get out of here and actually drove the scooter down the road to Yonville, got the job as a busboy, and now years later, here we are talking about a wine from Camus. So it's this weird, fortuitous path that we're on. Um, <laughs> I think for me, one thing that's super interesting, and if you want to touch on it just for a second, most of the wines we see in California are labeled by grapes, but this is one where even on the label, there's no mention of the grapes. So what is the conundrum? What is the puzzle? Why the blend? Yeah, so starting off in the late 80s when uh, Conundrum was first being bottled, it was bottled as a white wine, and, and you're right. So uh, here we have a blend of uh, Chardonnay, of uh, Simeon, Sauvignon Blanc, Viognier, and a few other things. And the real advantage to a, a blend like this is not only do you get uh, a lot broader of a range of flavors to play with in kind of your toolkit as a winemaker, uh, but also it uh, uh, allows you to showcase different appellations from all around California and give you a system of consistency. There are some grapes here that are going to do great in cooler or slightly wetter years, some that are going to really excel in warmer and or drier years. And so by, again, blending from many places and from different grape varieties, you're ensured to get something that's really interesting and special year in and year out. Yeah, and for me, I, I, it's kind of interesting because as we study wine from around the world, almost every other region in the world, and for like the thousands of years that wine has been with us, traditionally you blend. Because yep. it's just, it's it's smart farming. You're hedging your bet. You're not putting all your, uh, you know, eggs in one basket, using another analogy. Um, and it just makes sense. And I think back to kind of our origins as a wine drinking country and coming out of prohibition, you know, the most popular wines were blends, actually. Um, yep. But we were completely bastardizing names of places in Europe. And I distinctly remember a story that uh, Dick Peterson told, and he was a big winemaker from California. And he talked about on the bottling line, they were bottling Chablis. And they stopped the bottling line, changed out the bottles, but did not change the wine, and then start to bottle Sautern. And it was exactly the same wine. It just in one market, Chablis sold better, one market, Sautern sold better. And I love that that was kind of the origin and the foundation, but then some great wine writers like Frank Schumacher were like, guys, we're not Chablis, we're not Sautern, we're not Mountain Burgundy, start labeling wines by grapes. And it's kind of interesting that we went all in, and it is only now that we kind of go back to our origins and talk about blends is like this anomaly even though they've been with us for a long time. We should probably taste the white because, you know, it, to me, it was what built the reputation. 
So when you pick up the glass, what's like the first thing that jumps out for you on the white? Well, let's get it out. So yeah, those of you who are joining us, we're tasting today the 2018 conundrum. Uh, but my understanding is the 19s have just come out. So it's possible that you'll be picking that one up as well. If so, not to worry. The thing I love about this wine is year to year, although there's small changes, it's a really consistent, has a signature style to it. And so getting it in the glass for me, it's got this wonderful kind of deep golden color. And already without, you know, putting my nose in the glass, there's aromas that are leaping out of just kind of ripe peach, melon, and a really distinctive floral component, almost like honeysuckle or orange blossoms. Yeah, it's, I, I, I've, it just smells like fun and summer. And I can't really sum it up much better than that. But it's just like, you know, you see like those, you know, days of people just going crazy at parties and having a blast. And it just kind of smells like that and feels like that. It's just sexy, alluring, but also totally approachable. Yeah, and for those of you out there who are used to drinking California examples of Chardonnay, which is you know a wine that I absolutely love, this is going to smell a little bit different. Those contributions of, again, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Viognier, and even that little bit of Muscat are really lifting up those aromas to get those, those floral notes that you just can't get out of any Chardonnay, no matter what you do to it. But the fun part, too, is it smells one way, but then I get it on the palate, and it's not as fruity as it smells. And right. I can see people like, oh, I don't like sweet wines. It's like... This may smell right, but it's certainly not sweet at all. And it's actually pretty crisp, pretty refreshing. So I think the same way that, you know, it's big that your shard drinker may be happy, but it's also a little bit more interesting and fleshier than, say, a Sauvignon Blanc. It's not as angular and angry, but it's still crisp, refreshing, you know, or you could almost even say Pinot Grigio with like an amazing costume on. Yeah, that goes back to the brilliance of blending, right? You get these aromatic grape varieties that are giving you a really exciting nose. And then that Chardonnay and Simeon, which are traditionally kind of more textural kind of uh, kind of grapes, are adding that body and sort of silkiness to the wine that uh, you can't get out of just, a, a say, a Sauvignon Blanc or a, or a Viognier. Yeah, and going back to those of you that have been lucky enough to go by Del Fresco's Grill, pick up that meal kit, this is to go with the, the Caesar salad. And it's just one of those things, think about, you know, put the Caesar salad out, chill this down and just crush. And then uh, let's go into the red because the red's kind of fun. I think it's, you know, relatively to me, conundrum has always been the whites were what I thought of as conundrum. And I love now that there's a red conundrum and on the nose, it is big, big brooding, kind of huge. Yeah, absolutely. Really dark, uh, darker fruit profile. So I get, uh, you know, gorgeous dark cherries, dark plum, even venturing into some blueberry. It's like the all the berry pie, you know, like you've got, you know, blueberries, blackberries, but it's also this kind of jamminess. I can even get almost even kind of like a graham cracker crust thing going on. And even like a little bit of like a la mode, like there's even like that little scoop of vanilla ice cream kind of, you know, probably from the oak treatment shown through the little vanilla spice. Yeah, really good judicious use of oak. Um, and for me, it has some nice base notes. I think of like mocha, so chocolate, coffee. The first thing about the palate that I really appreciate is, um, you know, the versatility of, uh, of the texture and the tannin here. So this is not those monster tannins that you get out of 100% Cabernet Sauvignon style wine. This is a lot suaver, a lot friendlier. And we have ours at a slight chill, which I actually really appreciate. It's kind of the perfect summer wine in that way. So again, those tannins aren't overbearing. You just get something that's really friendly, really crushable, like you were saying before. All right. So tasting the red wine, it just makes me think of like the legend behind how Conundrum began. The legend is supposedly Charlie Sr., Charlie Wagner's grandfather, and we're going to get to meet Charlie um, here in just a moment. But supposedly his grandfather was famous for sitting around the Wagner dining table and just kind of grabbing bottles and mixing and matching, coming up with a blend. And when I try this red, it just makes me think back to that, you know, just kind of classic blend of not too fruity, not too dry, not too big, just round, just smooth. And this, and I'd be very curious when we get Charlie um, 
Junior on in a moment because also to the Wagners, you have Charlie Sr., who's the grandfather. Then you have Chuck, who is Charlie's father. And then we have Charlie Jr., who we'll get to meet in a moment, just as I said. So I think it's, to me, I'd, I'd love to hear, like, is this the type of wine that grandpa was making at the table? Because to me, this feels like it should be and kind of probably what it was. But I think it's a really nice addition. And, you know, I look forward to, as Travis mentioned, chilling it down, having it on a hot day. Um, I believe with the meal kit, we've got this with uh, two fillets. So I would get the barbecue fired up, cook up those steaks, and just not even think about it, and the bottle will be gone in a heartbeat. Travis, did you have anything you want to add on the on the red? No, just a great addition to the conundrum family, and I'm really excited to talk to Charlie about it. All right, and I think that is a perfect lead-in. Um, let's uh, go ahead and talk to Charlie because um, – Conundrum, besides being a blend of different grapes, is a blend of different regions. And I know that you're, you know, Charlie's kind of the expert on the family on going outside of Napa. So everyone, I'd love to uh, introduce Charlie Wagner Jr. And uh, welcome to the Two Bottle Tasting Series. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, you know, speaking of Conundrum, um, how, how do, I mean, how do you even start it? I mean, you have so many pieces, like the pieces of the puzzle to play with. Where do you even begin? Well, uh, because it's a, a California appellation, we we can source fruit from anywhere in the state, which is which is an awesome luxury to have. Um, and really, the conundrum has always been evolving in style. Um, it's never the same recipe every year. So we have sort of the the base uh, blend that we like to to get together and, and sort of keep. Uh, year to year, but every year we're experimenting. So it really is a, a very fun wine to make. Uh, we have all the freedom in the world to, to do whatever we want with it. And um, so there's kind of no rules with this wine. And, and that's really what makes it so fun to, to produce. Cool. And would it be safe to say that the red is kind of like the wines that your grandfather used to blend at the table? Or was he more yeah, messing he, around with the whites? He started with with the whites and, um, and he would blend... Uh, any anything really but he uh our family's uh, uh heritage comes uh, from alsace so he was always drinking wines from alsace pinot pinot blanc riesling pinot gris uh, muscat and uh, so that was that was the inspiration for the the first renditions of conundrum white and um and then the red came along in 2009 we we figured that conundrum white needed a sort of a, we see him as a brother sister kind of wine relationship, I guess. So <laughs> uh, we started making uh, 2009 was the first vintage of Conundrum Red and, and it's evolved also since, since then. So before Charlie, we were talking about, um, you know, getting notes from basically four principal grapes in the white wine. So Chardonnay, Simeon, Sauvignon Blanc, and Viognier. Are the, all those typically consistent pieces or are you really starting from scratch year in and year out? Those are, those are very consistent pieces. Uh, and also Muscat would be the, the fifth one to add in there. In the evolution of Conundrum White, if you, you may remember it from uh, years past, it was had a little bit more residual sugar. We've, uh, mm -hmm. we've dried it up a little bit over, over the past few years and had some good response to that. I think it's, I think it's fair to say it's becoming a little bit more of a serious wine, but it, it's still fun because of what we what we blend into it fantastic and and charlie when was the transition because if i remember correctly i mean it was almost kind of labeled as camus conundrum and now it's kind of its brand on its own it was that kind of just you coming into into the forefront and saying like this is my baby i want to run with it well or... I, yeah that's uh let's see i think that was probably uh, 2007, 2008 was when we uh, we took the Camus name off the label. Uh, we we thought Conundrum in the in the marketplace could stand on its own as its own brand, and um, and of course uh, with Camus we we are known for for Cabernet. We don't want to confuse that with the uh, consumer. So yeah, I think it was uh, 2007 or so when we started to to migrate the uh, the Camus name off the label. Cool. And then um, as a as a napkin myself, um, it was a weird place to grow up. And I can only imagine how was it growing up as part of the Camus family and seeing what your grandfather did, your father did, you know, how was it kind of getting handed the reins to take over the family business or run parts of the family business? Well, uh, I grew up here on the property, uh, just uh, 500 feet away from the winery. So, of course, my first job was 
uh, I don't know, probably kindergarten, uh, <laughs> five years old, maybe, uh, shoveling out tanks. Um, and it, you know, I just, I thought it was fun it, and it still is fun. It, I didn't see it as a job. Um, I mean, we all just kind of grew up in it and, um, uh, it just came naturally, I guess. And it, it's been, a it's been a great ride and, and we have a lot of fun with what we do and, uh, you know, fully involved in every aspect of it every day. So it, it's, uh, still learning. We're, we're still all learning. Awesome. For those who may not be familiar with how the blending process works, can you walk us through, you know, you're in the winery, you now have all these different parts together. How does it work for you to put things um, together in such a way to consistently get a conundrum white or a conundrum red? Uh, that, that's a, a great, uh, great question. So we keep everything separate. We harvest uh, different blocks. Of course, they come on, uh, ripeness comes on differently uh, depending on the varietal. So uh, for example, the Sauvignon Blanc, which we've started harvesting in Napa Valley uh, that goes into Conundrum White. We, we started harvesting last week. So that'd be the first stuff to, to come in, the first grapes to come in. Uh, we'd ferment everything separate. So the, the Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Simeon, Viognier, and Muscat uh, all get fermented. Uh, some gets barrel fermented, some gets tank fermented. So uh, the Chardonnay gets barrel fermented and, uh, and then is aged in wood, whereas the Sauvignon Blanc stays in stainless steel its, its entire life until bottling. Um, and then about uh, two or three months before bottling, we start assembling the, the blend. And we start uh, with, you know, uh, basically a bench blend. So you have a, a ratios of what each tank is, uh, has whatever amount of gallons in it. And we, we do bench blends. And dial it in as needed if it's uh say it's too round and we there's a lot of chardonnay in it we might cut back on the chardonnay before we actually do the real blend so the the blending uh takes some time that that's really one of the most fun parts of making this wine cool and then with the red are you a believer of find the blend then let it age before releasing it or do you kind of let each lot find its place and then blend closer to bottling Again, that's the same same process. We keep everything separate. Um, we see it a little differently with these wines. We keep everything separate because once it's once it's blended, you can't unblend it. So <laughs> yes. we, we want to keep everything uh, separate as um, uh, until the until the very last minute. Um, and so the the conundrum red we keep keep separate, and, and the varieties that go into conundrum red are also. Uh, they come on uh, come on ripeness different times uh, at different times, so it's nice for us to be able to stagger tanks on the production side, not have everything come in at once. Um, but we do keep everything separate. Of course, uh, uh, everything that goes into kind of red goes into barrel, so it's a little different than the white in that sense. And. Speaking of styles, and you kind of alluded that the conundrum style has changed over the years. And I, you know, with the Cabernet that your family is so famous for, it has evolved with the years. And it seems that you guys do a really good job of being just a little bit ahead of the curve and almost in some ways kind of setting where everyone's going. Is that just something that you guys are tasting constantly? How, what are the ethos of that? How does that keep happening where it seems like you're a step ahead of everybody else? Well, I, I, so we, we taste a lot of wines, um, as, as you guys do. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> and we taste, uh, we taste all of our neighbors' wines. We taste our friends' wines. We, we buy, uh, wines off the shelf every day. And, um, we like to see where, where people are with what styles, what, what gets attention, um, what sells, what tastes good. And I think that's, that's very important to, to stay on top of that. We, we really, um, I think all of our wines evolve over time. We, we aren't, we aren't set in our ways. We're always experimenting with, with different techniques, uh, whether it's in the vineyard or in the cellar. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, very important part of our business is, is tasting everybody's wines. And, uh, and it, it's really a, a learning experience in itself. As you, as you know, uh, you learn, you can learn a lot from, from, uh, smelling and tasting, uh, a bunch of different wines from all over the world. Charlie, you mentioned that Sauvignon Blanc's already coming in right now. And for me, that's always like that time of year in Napa is just so magical and special. And just the energy in the valley is incredible. And I distinctly even remember, like, uh, I was fortunate enough to work at Shandon. I remember, like, driving home through the valley at night. And when you can actually smell the whole valley smelling like fermentation, 
It's just this incredible time and energy. How do you how do you take a break for that? Especially if you're bringing in grapes from all over California, I have to imagine this is probably what a two month, six week process for you that you're just now starting. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, we're just starting Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc right now, and we'll go into um, probably this year, the beginning of October, with our Central Coast, uh, with our Central Coast fruit. So, yeah, it's a it's a busy time. We're just just starting uh, right now. The valley is beautiful place right now. It smells sweet. You know, we have uh, we're just starting to see fruit trucks. Um, of course, we have a fire burning right over the hill right now. So there's a little smoke in the air today, but. Um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a energy filled time of year. We we love it. This is what we live for. And speaking of other areas, is there a spot that you just kind of every year you're like, wow, these grapes are something special? And as you know, you kind of just going, huh? Maybe we should look for a little more land here. Is there that kind of little diamond in the rough that you know? Because you guys source from all over the state. You know, what what are your little spots where you're like, I should maybe spend a little more time here, or you know, maybe invest a little more. Well, um, San Benito County is a, a special spot for us. That's uh, just uh, just east of Monterey County, um, a little bit further away from the ocean. You could grow dark red varietals there. That's uh, some of the, the fruit that goes into Conundrum Red uh, comes from there. Um, but um, more recently, our focus has been just east of Napa, uh, Solano County. There's an area called Susun Valley where we, we think uh, Petite Syrah is the number one grape out there a, a lot of great grapes grow out there but we we focused on petite syrah and we've actually bottled a wine uh, called camus sassoon and it's labeled as grand derif it's a, a petite syrah and um so we we're very excited about the area just it's uh, from where i'm sitting right now it's about a 35 minute drive and uh, feels very similar to napa valley but but fairly undiscovered yeah, that's that little spot where, like, if you're going up to Berryessa, instead of hanging a left to go to Berryessa, you hang a right. And it's that little kind of foothills at the backside of the, you know, the, what is it, the Vaca Range. That's a really sweet little spot. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, you, you have Wooden Valley over there and then Sassoon Valley. They're, they're both hidden gems. Yeah. Um, one thing that I was really impressed with was some of the, the vineyard shots um, from your Petit Syrah vineyard, speaking of Petit Syrah in Arroyo Seco, that vineyard just looks like awesome and gnarly and almost kind of moonscape. And I mean, it's probably not that far from the coast, but it almost looks like a desert. Um, how, do, how do the grapes do there? And, you know, aren't you guys doing some kind of weird, you know, almost bush training, but not bush training? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so those are crown pruned. Uh, crown trained vines so there's no trellis there's a just a single stake that the vine is trained trained up it's sort of a, a throwback to the uh, to the old days you don't see too many new plantings like that um, of course because there's no trellis and and uh, uh, no wires you you everything's hand harvested and a lot of uh, hand training to get the vine to to do its thing um, it's an amazing place Arroyo Seco uh, is uh, in Monterey County, but it's out of the wind. So Royo Seco from our Chardonnay and Pinot Noir vineyards is uh, maybe a 15 minute drive, but you could get dark red varietals to ripen there. Whereas you could never get Petit Syrah to get fully ripe or Zinfandel to get fully ripe in uh, Salinas Valley in the Santa Lucia Highlands. So it's, it's a hidden gem of a place. And it, the reason why it's so warm is because there's no wind. It's kind of tucked out uh, away from the, the Salinas Valley. It's, it's an amazing place. Yeah, it's. I laugh a little bit because growing up in Napa and on the West Coast, everyone's always like, oh, you don't have four seasons there. And I kind of feel like you can get four seasons of weather, just drive 30 miles one way or another, and you can get that. You know, Or if you've been in San Francisco in August, you can have all four seasons in a day. Yeah. Um, but, but it is shocking how much just a few miles in and getting out of the wind can make a difference. So with, with all these, uh, projects that, uh, you have going on, you've, uh, come to know California really well, but I understand you're also exploring some projects in Argentina. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. We, we have, um, so we've been making a wine, uh, from Mendoza called Red Schooner and it's a, a Malbec. Uh, we, we, uh, harvest the fruit. Um, chill it down and, and ship it up here to California and ferment here, which is which is our off season. So we get the fruit up here about April, 
it takes about a month to get here in a chilled um, uh, reefer units. And um, the wine is uh, is available at, at a lot of the, uh, the retail outlets right now. Um, there's uh, another project we have, very similar concept to that, uh, to the Red Schooner, and it's uh, a wine out of the Barossa Valley, Barossa and McLaren Vale in Australia. And um, we bottled a couple vintages of it. We don't have a, a name for the label yet, so we got the wine right. Now we just need a <laughs> we need a name and a and a label, uh, but si- similar concept where we chill the fruit, uh, ship it here, and that's a, a Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignon blend. And also we did a little bit of Grenache from there uh, as a fun little side project. So, yeah, Australia and Argentina are are very uh, fun places. I didn't get to travel there this year because of the circumstances with COVID and all that, but um pretty pretty fun projects keeps us all on our toes and keeps our seller crew working year round really we we're pretty much fermenting all, almost year <laughs> round nowadays so right. yeah so you're a little bit busy <laughs> we're all having fun all right so travis you'll totally back me up on this but conundrum has always been kind of this awesome like swiss army knife wine for a sommelier because it just goes great with food um, and I love that our chef Ariel Fox has gone for the Caesar salad, the filet, and you know I'm just be curious, Charlie, what what do you like to have conundrum with? Because for me, it's always been such an awesome wine at the table with just about everything. But I'm sure there's got to be a favorite, you know, pairing that you enjoy with it. Well, I, I think uh, with uh, conundrum white, I love Mexican food. Uh, I think ceviche uh, and conundrum white, and especially something with a little spice. And uh, an ice cold glass of Conundrum White, I think you, you can't go wrong with it. Um, I think uh, Travis mentioned that the, the Conundrum Red, you have it a little bit chilled on the table there. Um, I drink it the same way. I, I chill the Conundrum Red. It's inevitable that it's going to warm up on the table, right? So um, I, I love to, to have, again, Mexican food, spicy food with, with chilled Conundrum Red is a, a match made in heaven, but also just a simple hamburger uh, or barbecued smoked, smoked meat, stuff like that. Um, always tastes great with those wines. Wow, that that actually sounds delicious. And um, hopefully at some point we can all get together in the future, sit around a table, crush some tacos because, uh, and, you know, start with some conundrum and then maybe finish up with just a little beer at the end. But uh, Travis, it has been a treat. Always fun to taste with you. Um, Charlie, truly an honor to meet you. Um, I guess I was lucky enough to meet your grandfather many years ago, um, your father way back in the 90s at Spago. And um, just thank you for keeping up the tradition of, you know, doing great work in Napa and still being a great family run winery. It's really special and part of what makes the wine industry great. So thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>